Well, we got some details late this afternoon. Tomorrow morning, we finally get to see the Mueller report, how much of it we'll see, and where we go from here, where a former federal prosecutor will join us this evening to hash it all out. Then our legal panel will weigh in on a bunch of big stories in the news, including the measles outbreak, the intersection between the law and public health. Also, the college admissions scandal. Felicity Huffman, she's pled guilty, but Lori Laughlin has entered a not guilty plea. Two actresses, two different strategies. Which one will pay off? Evening, everyone, and welcome to RFL. I am Richard French. Well, I can tell you when at least. 9.30 tomorrow morning. Attorney General William Barr, he's going to hold a news conference on the Mueller report. He'll be joined by Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. So the countdown is on as everyone eagerly will wait its response. On the eve of the release of the Mueller report, the White House sounding optimistic. The mood's great, actually. It's actually a very fun place to work, and I, I enjoy it. I enjoy my work here. The president's been very busy with his teams today. We're talking about health care and a bunch of other issues. The 400-page report, the result of a nearly two-year investigation into possible collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia, as well as obstruction of justice. That report will be delivered to Congress, but with redaction. I'm sure people will cherry pick and try to find something in there. While Congress and the president's legal team pour over the details, the president is casting his own narrative. No collusion, no obstruction, based on Attorney General William Barr's four-page summary of the main findings released last month. Trump seemingly unconcerned about what may be in the rest of the report. I heard it's going to come out on Thursday. That's good. And there can't be anything there because there was no crime. There was no anything. The crime was committed by the other side. This crime was all made up. It was all a fabrication. In Barr's letter, he said special counsel Robert Mueller's report does not conclude the president committed a crime. It does not exonerate him on the obstruction of justice issue. The president, though, still calling that total exoneration. So as you just heard in that piece, the president says he's been totally cleared, but the majority of people, they don't buy it. Less than a third of the American public believes that the report will exonerate him, and obviously we're going to find out much more tomorrow when it's get laid in front. For more on what to expect tomorrow, let's bring in former federal prosecutor Stephen Mulroy. So, Stephen, this is, I guess, the $64,000 question. Will we ever get to see the full report and... Since we know it's going to be redacted tomorrow, will subpoenas from the Democrats at the end of the day force the release, at least for those committees' eyes only? Certain members of the House will be able to see the full unredacted report. There's some good case law suggesting that, uh, especially when there are significant issues of you know, impeachment that the House may want to take up, that they have the right to uh, see the full unredacted report. Uh, whether the public will be able to see the entire unredacted report is a dicier proposition. There are some parts of it that relate to grand jury testimony that do need to be secret. There are other parts like classified information that do need to be secret. Other areas that are more judgment calls like, uh, you know, something pertaining to an ongoing investigation or having to do with an individual that is not going to be charged. Those are not strict legal requirements. They're more a matter of discretion, and it's quite possible that even the public at large would be able to see uh, parts of the report that had initially been redacted for those reasons. So we know it's going to be redacted to some degree, but just how much would you hazard a guess? And do you think we'll learn anything significant from tomorrow's release, or is it your guess that most of the big ticket items we already know? Attorney General Barr has indicated uh, a disposition to err on the side of redacting rather than not redacting. I could be wrong about that. Um, he has indicated that it'll be color-coded, which I think is very helpful. So we'll indicate the reasons for the redaction, whether it's grand jury or classified information or protecting an ongoing investigation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I do think that we will learn new information from even a redacted report. You know, that four-page summary was pretty conclusory in nature. It didn't really go into any kind of detail as to what evidence the Mueller report uncovered and considered regarding the, uh, A, the question of cooperation between the Trump campaign and Russia, and B, questions of obstruction of justice. So, for example, there's going to be uh, information relating to what members of the Trump campaign knew about 
Russian interference and at what point in the chronology. Some of that may simply confirm things we've already heard in media reports, but that's still important. And I think it'll fill in a lot of the details about that chronology. And then I also think that we will learn, it was quite possible we will learn that there is evidence suggestive of obstruction, but what the exact reason for not making a decision on obstruction was. Was it simply because the DOJ policy is that a sitting president is not indicted? Or were there other reasons why Mueller didn't go forward with obstruction charges? So I think that there'll be a lot of value that we can learn, um, even from a heavily redacted report, uh, because the, the bar summary was just so short and, and sweet and conclusory. So I'm sure like the rest of us at 9.30 tomorrow when this report drops, you're going to be digging into it. What are you going to be looking for specifically? Well, tomorrow happens to be a very heavy teaching day at the University of Memphis School of Law, so there are going to be uh, limited opportunities for me to look into it. But when I can dig into it, I'm going to be looking for, in particular, one thing I'm curious about is any, any suggestion of a link between decisions that the Trump administration made uh, both during the administration, during the transition period, and even during the campaign, the Trump campaign, regarding sanctions against Russia. Because it seems that that was a big, heavy emphasis by the Russian government during the campaign and afterwards, a big part of their motivation for wanting Donald Trump to be elected rather than Hillary Clinton. And at the same time, at various points in the chronology during the campaign and transition period and early on in the administration, the administration did make statements and decisions that were favorable to Russia on the uh, issue of sanctions and their intervention in Ukraine. Um, I'm looking to see in the Mueller report what more, what new, if anything, we know about the exact chronology and whether there's any reason to infer a potential link between those two, because that would be very serious indeed. How about possible wild cards, Stephen, like people who we're not talking about now who will be front and center after the release? People, for example, like Hope Hicks or maybe even Don McGahn. Quite possibly. I mean, some of those people who left the administration early under circumstances suggesting that, you know, all was not rosy between them and the administration, they might very well have had uh, information, you know, they might have um, provided some cooperation. And from what we know of this president, um, you know, he won't take a forgive and forget mindset. You know, there there is potential grudge holding that may result from that. So I think you're right to be looking for that. Now, Barr has already said no further indictments from the Mueller report, but that at the end is just one court with one jury. What are the chances, do you think, that we'll learn something tomorrow or from the additional probes that come out that could spark additional prosecutions, for example, from the Southern or the Eastern District? It's possible that a new investigation may be spurred by some of the information in the Mueller report, but actually, when you think about it, there are probably at least 20 different jurisdictions around the country that are investigating some aspect of the Trump administration. A lot of it um, you know, were spinoffs from the Mueller report. So Mueller himself took several parts of the investigation and assigned them to various U.S. attorney's offices in uh, New York and in D.C. and in Maryland. Uh, and then we have state prosecutors in Maryland and New York who are doing their own investigations. So it's possible that what we learn from the Mueller report may already be part of those other investigations or become part of those already existing ongoing investigations once that information comes to light. Understandably, Stephen, so many are going to be focusing on obstruction since Mueller didn't reach a conclusion on it, even though Barr seemingly did. Is it possible we get evidence of obstruction that could not be proven to the point of criminal prosecution? And also remind everyone what has to be proven for a criminal prosecution when it comes to obstruction. For obstruction of justice, you have to show that somebody with corrupt intent uh, intentionally attempted or succeeded uh, in interfering with an ongoing judicial proceeding, which could be an actual court proceeding or a federal investigation or even, you know, a congressional investigation. Um, and that could be taking the form of witness tampering, uh, discouraging uh, witnesses, retaliating against officials who were in the process of investigating any of those things, if they or hiding evidence. Uh, anything along those lines, if it was done with the so-called corrupt intent to actually interfere with an ongoing investigation. And I think that it's uh, it's possible, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, we might find out that there is evidence suggestive of, of corruption, but 
that it wasn't enough, in Mueller's view, to provide proof beyond a reasonable doubt, but it might be enough for impeachment, or it might be that it might even have been enough for a potential criminal prosecution, but there were issues of immunity. So, for example, the Department of Justice policy is that as a separation of powers matter, you cannot indict a sitting president. The only remedy for a sitting president would be impeachment. So if you know that were the reason why Mueller didn't take a position on obstruction of justice, that would be very damning for the president uh, if it was simply that there was evidence but not enough to go beyond a reasonable doubt, then that would sort of be a middle ground. Or it could be just there was no evidence at all, which would you know be uh, uh, very good for the president. Although Mueller was careful to say that the report didn't exonerate the president. So that suggested that there's at least some evidence in the report uh, indicative of obstruction, even if not a slam dunk proof of obstruction. Stephen Mulroy, thank you so much. And of course, we'll be checking in, particularly after tomorrow. All right, coming up next, everybody. As the measles outbreak spreads, state and local leaders, they're trying to figure out how to stop it. Well, we're going to bring in the legal panel after this to take a look at how public health and the law are intersecting.